I love discovering new games. Like, I don't mean discovering a new game as in finally getting around to a game I've been meaning to play for a while, no. I mean literally just discovering one. Like, sometimes it's just fun to browse deep into the libraries of old video game consoles, or to just explore the back pages of online digital storefronts, just to see if I can find a cool looking game I've never seen before. And usually, when I do find something, I'm just kind of left wondering, huh, this looks cool. I wonder if it's actually any good. Backlogged is an online video game tracking website, where you can keep a record of games you've played and already beaten, as well as keep a tally on the games that are, well, in your backlog. You can also rate and review games on the site and compare and share these reviews with your friends. It's basically just letterbox, but for video games. And while it is satisfying to just take a big ol' look at every single game I've ever played in one place, but I do feel like most people, myself included, mostly just use the site for its review feature. You know, it's just nice to have a place where you can just talk your shit about a game, whether it be a super serious, well thought out text wall of a review, a short snippet of someone's raw feelings, or just a plain old shitpost. But then I got to thinking, this website has like, a bajillion games on it. More games than anyone could possibly know what to do with. So what if we took the time to take a look at the truly obscure? We sifted deep into backlogs, well, backlog, and become some of the first to log and review a couple of unlogged games on this site. I don't know, just seemed like a fun video idea to put out between my bigger projects. And it's always nice to put out just a little review style video, I don't really get to do a lot of those. So for this first episode in a hopefully ongoing series, I picked out three truly random games. No gimmick or anything, just games I thought looked somewhat interesting. We have Escape from the Haunted House on Windows PC, Hop the Movie for the Nintendo DS, and a Love Quest, also for the PC. Let's get started. Alright, first up, Escape from the Haunted House. Now this seems right up my alley. Probably one of my favorite weirdly specific horror game setups is the whole Oh no, you're trapped in a haunted, a singular location full of ghosts or ghouls or zombies or whatever, and now you have to solve puzzles to find your way out, Ooh. Now that I think about that though, I guess a lot of horror games could be described as trying to escape a location with an evil creature in it, but I just really like it if ghosts are involved, I don't know, I just thought ghosts were cool. So, based off the title alone, Escape from the Haunted House seems absolutely perfect. This was actually my first time using DOSBox to play any kind of game, which was a little intimidating at first. But, luckily for me, someone just so kindly managed to set up a whole installer that sets up DOSBox and everything just for this one little game. So big thanks to Biffman from the Collection Chamber for doing all the work for me. And while I'm at it, I should probably also thank Biffman for doing the majority of the research for this segment of the video, because info regarding the generically named publishing company New Media Generation is scarce. From the looks of it, they are a Russian company, mostly known for their work on translating games for their home country though they have made a couple of games for themselves in the past. And funnily enough, this game was thought to be a Russian exclusive for quite some time, until Biffman himself just so happened across a professionally English translated ISO of this game just on the internet. So I mean, it must have been also published in the UK, right? Now, like I said before, I had pretty high hopes for this game. And right off the bat, it seems like it's gonna be a pretty promising time. I mean, just take a look at this sick ass, 90s ass, FMV intro. Years, the place is haunted. Haunted? No one goes near the place. Why is that? The house has been empty for years, but at night, you can see a light in the window. And there are these strange noises. Oh my god. 
And yeah, if I had at least one positive thing to say about this game, it would be the graphics. I mean, just look at it. Pure, unfiltered 90s CGI environments in its purest form. You'll love to see it. And it all looks super duper impressive for the time, though the environments, while really good looking, don't exactly scream haunted house to me. I mean, sure, it's a little eerie at times, but everything's just so clean and empty. You know, I'm just not really getting the haunted house vibe from Escape from the Haunted House. And unfortunately, after stepping through those doors and taking in all the scenery, that's where the positives end. And the first of many problems rears its ugly head. Where the hell am I going? Finding where to go and how to progress is a challenge in of itself in this game, where most games would at least throw you a bone and kinda point you in some sort of direction, Escape from the Haunted House just leaves you to piece it all together. Which I mean, I have no problems with ambiguity and figuring out stuff on my own in these types of games. Sometimes it's nice just to let the player loose and have them slowly piece it all together. But the issue that makes navigating through the game extra frustrating is most things in the environment that, you know, look super important, just aren't. Oh, what's this? A clearly visible piece of paper on this desk in the corner of this otherwise barren library room, located in an area where the player's eyes are immediately drawn to? Oh no, that's literally nothing. Just keep walking. And the game pulls shit like this constantly. Majority of things that you see, or even just entire rooms, are just completely pointless. And acting as the other slice of bread on this shit sandwich is the fact that the things you need to find to progress are usually just completely fucking stupid. Just for example, let's head back to the first hurdle of this journey. After finding nothing but dead ends and locked doors in the first 15 minutes, my only lead was this one room all the way at the end of the mansion full of these cupboards. Now, most of these cupboards were also locked, all except one drawer on this desk, which opens to reveal a note talking about having to find some gears to fix an engine or something. So what, am I supposed to go around the environment, maybe look for these gears, read the note closely and see if it has any clues as to where this engine is even located? Nope, this is actually a puzzle for much, much later. You see, the real answer was I was supposed to click on this one part of the desk that looks nothing like a drawer to open a secret compartment to get this key. Okay, so maybe finding things in the environment feels a bit shitty, but what about the actual puzzles? I mean, this is a puzzle game after all. Well, there are a couple of classic puzzles in here. Puzzles that just exist to be little games you have to do that don't actually have anything to do with the environment or the story or anything like that. The first one being this absolutely dreaded lights out puzzles. You know, those horrible little things where you click on a square and it flips on or off all the other squares around it. This has just never been fun in anything, like even once. But on the flip side, among these is actually the best puzzle in the game. It's just this little pipe puzzle where you have to connect all these pipes with this blue fluid by spinning these intersections and matching the numbers up so they can go through. Like, it isn't too fun or anything and is extremely time consuming, but like, it was kind of satisfying to figure out. And other than those two, the rest of the puzzles actually rely on reading notes and finding things in the environment, like a standard puzzle adventure game. Like the gear puzzle I brought up from earlier. The note tries to tell you something about putting the gears together in a certain order and reading these weird fractions that are labeled on the gears themselves to achieve some sort of percentage or something. Although if I'm being real, I kind of just slapped them together and it just sort of worked out. Honestly, I think the absolute worst part about the puzzle solving in this game is, even when you beat one, 
like, 75% of the time, you have no fucking idea what it even achieved. Like, sure, you'll hear the mansion vaguely rumble and grumble, indicating that you, you know, actually did something. But what did it unlock? What did this achieve? Who fucking knows? And these 10 second midi loops do not help things at all. At first, they're a little charming, but when you're aimlessly wandering around for like 30 minutes trying to figure out what to do next, or staring down the barrel of a 30 minute pipe puzzle, it just gets fucking grating. And all of this comes to a head at the game's worst and pen ultimate challenge the telephone puzzle. Okay, so after you unlock and gain access to the entirety of the mansion, it's time to escape. You need to go into this big circle room, set the time on this clock to 7.35. Don't ask why, at this point I was just reading off the guide trying to get this over with as soon as possible. Which unlocks this door all the way on the other side of the house, which is our escape. Not this room right next to the clock where you can clearly see the outside perfectly and looks like a great exit. Nope, just the one that doesn't even look like an exit at all. And the challenge of the puzzle is actually finding a way over there, as setting the clock to this blocks an otherwise crucial secret path to get through the entirety of the mansion. Well, you were supposed to figure out that this note in this cabinet with all of these numbers next to these names were actually phone numbers, and calling them actually swaps around some of the rooms in the house. Now, the fact that these were supposed to even be phone numbers in the first place was a little baffling to me, but this is more of a regional issue. Apparently, five to six digit phone numbers is the standard over in Russia, so, you know, that's just something that got lost in translation. But knowing that calling these numbers is supposed to swap rooms in the house in the first place, or even what rooms they swap to, is just plain stupid fucking guesswork. And the even more baffling thing about this, that, that I just can't even wrap my head around, is later you go into this sort of den area, and you find another phone with another set of phone numbers on a piece of paper. And I figured, oh, this must be another layer of the puzzle. Maybe this will introduce new rooms to find new stuff in or something. All the phone numbers do nothing. I, I don't even know why they're here. They do absolutely fuck all. So yeah, that's the final puzzle in a nutshell. Get the perfect setup of rooms through pure trial and error, and you're home free. You get this ending cutscene where this skeleton burns in hell for no discernible reason, and the horrible Hell Mansion becomes your inheritance. And you want to know what the worst part is? I know I've said a lot of parts are the worst part, but this is actually the worst part. The house wasn't even fucking haunted. I was expecting some spooks, or some scares, or like anything, but there were only a total of like three ghost appearances that are all pretty lame. You have this lady watering this plant for like five seconds. This one hallway that turns you into a skeleton for no reason. And this Easter egg I can't show uncensored on YouTube. Henry, close the door, please. And usually part of these haunted house games is a bit of story that comes with it, like a little bit of intrigue into who these people were, how they died, or maybe even the reason why they're even fucking haunting the place. But you pretty much just get fuck all. The closest thing we get to any sort of intrigue is this random blue skull room in this guy's locked away secret lab. Like, maybe this Edward guy was into some cultish activity and that's why it's vaguely haunted? Man, I don't know. In conclusion, this game really sucked ass. It was confusing, tedious, and the best part was the opening cutscene. It has some neat visuals, but that's about all it has going for it. I'll give it about one star. Okay, now onto the game I'm least confident in in this little collection here. Which is extra bad, as since the one I thought was gonna kick ass turned out to be a total flop. We have Hop the Movie for the Nintendo DS. And I'm just gonna go out of the gate nitpicking here, because why is it called that? 
At first, I thought that was just, like, the name of the movie, but no, the film is just called Hop. And as far as I know, there isn't any other game on the DS called Hop, so why not just call it Hop? Calling it Hop the Movie makes it sound like one of those video GBA games, and it's just gonna play the whole movie in a glorious 4x3 DS dual screen quality. Actually, that sounds kinda cool. Okay, but who actually made this game? Alright, published by 505 Games. Yeah, they made a lot of crap for the DS, but it was developed by... Oh! Engine Software! A Dutch studio you may not have heard of, but you've probably played at least one of their games. I mean, as long as you've played any of the console versions of Terraria in the last 10 years. Yeah, nowadays this company is more so known for their port work, porting Terraria to basically every HD console known to man, and weirdly enough, their various ports of Suda games, making those amazing fucking ports of No More Heroes 1 and 2 to the Nintendo Switch, which are the best way to experience those games nowadays, as well as being responsible for the fucking phenomenal Killer7 PC port. But looking into the company's history during this era, it seems they are more so known for shoveling out licensed DS slop. Though if their future track record is any indicator, maybe we're in good hands. So let's just boot up this piece of crap and... Oh, it's a twin stick shooter! Or I guess in the case of the DS, it's a D-pad stylish shooter. But yeah, huh. You know, with a movie that looks like this, I was expecting some sort of garbage, shitty 2D platformer, or maybe like a shitty minigame collection or something, but hey, this is actually kind of cool. The story of the game is pretty simple, and I think follows the movie. You play as a scary-ass, pixelated, squash-and-stretch James Marsden, who sets out on a quest to become the first-ever human Easter Bunny, no matter how many he has to kill to get there. You know, for this review, I actually sat down and tried watching the movie this game is based on, but yeah, no, it was fucking terrible, I couldn't get through even half of it. Anyway, yeah, it's your basic twin-stick shooter. You move around with a D-pad and aim your gun with the stylus. And alternatively, if you've got some fucked up hands, you can use the face buttons as your D-pad. On the topic of weapons, you start out with this green, dinky little pea shooter thing, but quickly find more and more weapons to add to your arsenal as the game goes on. The first one you unlock being these chocolate egg grenades which can go over obstructions and turns any enemy it hits into chocolate. Be it sentry turrets, robots, even living rabbits and chickens, which also act as your health pickups. A bit morbid, but you know. I did run into a bit of an issue using these grenades though, that being you actually have to be firing your primary weapon in order to use them, but in order for the enemy to be turned into a health pickup, it has to be the grenade that kills them, and they don't really do that much damage. So I'd often find myself accidentally killing the enemies with my gun first when I wanted to turn them into chocolate. Grenades aren't all you get though, you find a new gun per world for a total of four. Though I mostly stuck to the second gun you get, this red marshmallow spread gun thing that slows down enemies upon hitting them, fires fast, and does a shit ton of damage. The other guns you get are this yellow chocolate hose gun that also turns enemies into chocolate, which I guess kinda makes the chocolate grenades kind of obsolete, but whatever and this cotton candy gun that's too short range and fires way too slow, but does a decent chunk of damage and immobilizes the targets that it doesn't one-shot. And as for the levels themselves, they're all pretty alright. Go through six levels across four different worlds, and the levels themselves actually do this thing I really like in games, where they intersect a bit, so you'll be going through certain areas more than once, but with different ambushes or weapons and stuff. It's neat. Your main collectibles in this game are these jelly beans, which don't actually do anything. There's no lives or shop or anything like that. The game just shows you how many you've collected over the course of the game, and that's about it. 
though the levels themselves do contain some hidden weapon upgrades scattered around, so there is at least a bit of an incentive to explore. And from the second level onward, you also start to find some pickups in the environment, like this soda that speeds you up, this shield power-up that makes you invincible for a limited time, and quite possibly the strangest screen nuke I've ever seen. The game has pretty good enemy variety for the most part, and never feels too easy or anything, though they do reuse the same shitty boss fight for the end of every world even as the game's final boss, which honestly sucks. And the game does suffer a bit from repetitious game design you see in a lot of licensed slop, like how every third level in a world is a boring ass moving platform gauntlet level that takes fucking forever, and how every world ends in the drumming minigame. It just feels lame and uninspired. Oh yeah, the minigames! On top of the six levels per world, in between every single level is a mandatory touchscreen minigame. I guess I wasn't completely wrong on my crappy minigame collection prediction after all. Yeah, it's uh, about what you expect you have to do with a DS stylus, hidden object games, whack-a-mole. The one that I probably dreaded the most was the bowling minigame though. Not because it was bad or anything, it was perfectly fine. It just took forever to finish. These minigames just really aren't that engaging and just make me wish I could get back to playing the video game a lot sooner. But yeah, other than that, a game that had every right to be just a terrible piece of shit turned out to be completely fine. Like, this game isn't amazing or anything. You don't have to drop everything you're doing to check this out. But I didn't have a bad time at all. And it's certainly better than the fucking movie it's based on. If you're looking for a slightly good twin-stick shooter on the Nintendo DS, then I guess that might fill that void. I'll give it 2.5 stars. Now onto the final game on our list, Love Quest. Developed by Otis Miller and published by Fire Cycle Games. Other than creating Love Quest, Otis has published a number of other smaller indie titles on Steam as well, all of which seeming to be pretty well received. Now before we even get into the game proper, I might as well address the elephant in the room. If you don't know, this game is actually based on the true story of an actual human being. Infamous internet personality Christine Weston Chandler, more commonly known by the online username Chris Chan. Now, personally, I am pretty familiar with most of their story, but uh, attempting to even give you a simplified version of it here would be far too complicated, controversial, and possibly even disturbing for a video like this. So I'll just say, if you're in the know, great. And if you're not, well, just go watch the Geno Samuel documentary. And although this game does heavily reference their life, I'm just gonna try and stick to the story presented within the game itself. This is supposed to be a review of the game, after all. Also, also, usually I don't really like the reviewing style you see online of people just verbatim recapping every single little thing that happens in a game, but since this game is so short and more so has a focus on its story rather than its gameplay, I'm kind of forced to just spoil the whole thing for you. So I'll just say it now, if you have any interest in playing this game for yourself, I recommend checking it out. But onto the game. In Love Quest, you play as a boy. I chose to name him Gungus. And in Love Quest, your main goal is, well, to complete your love quest by setting out and finding true love. Though that's going to be a bit harder than it seems, as your only approach is just going up to random women at your local mall and flat out asking, will you be my girlfriend? Not exactly the most charming conversation starter. And after a long, hard first day of asking any woman with a pulse if they'll be yours, you'll quickly find that pretty much all of your attempts end in the same result. The ladies cannot stand your ass, and even the dudes don't like you either, telling you to get lost or just straight up calling you ugly to your face, like, damn dude, what the hell? So after the love meter in the top left fully depletes after a long, hard day of rejection, it's time to go home and fucking game. 
Welcome to StarCat, a game where you play as a totally original, gangly little blue thing, and your goal is to blast through five different levels, avoiding obstacles and defeating enemies to collect all five Chaos Stars. StarCat has a couple of abilities to help him get there though, a double jump for getting across huge gaps, as well as a rolling attack and a star projectile attack, which are used to defeat enemies, though using these two abilities will deplete your star gauge. The StarCat sections here feel a bit janky, though I imagine that's purposefully so. It's really hard to move him precisely, especially when he's in the air, you have very little air control at all. But despite the lack of polish, these sections actually wound up being a good bit of fun. It manages to capture a bit of that Sonic Rush boost game dopamine of blasting through a bunch of enemies while trying your best to keep your boost gauge up. So it's nice to see even though it's obviously trying to parody Sonic, it still manages to capture a bit of that satisfying gameplay. And also I found this cool thing where if you jump as soon as you hit these dash panels you'll just go fucking soaring through the air and honestly that was a lot of fun too. Not much of note happens after you play these first two levels however, and after a long day of gaming it's time to go to bed. So we can wake up and do it all again. Day 2 is rougher than the last though, with not just the people at the mall becoming more aggressive towards us, but also with the introduction of security guards who will kick you right out the front door if they see you. And it doesn't help that the sound it makes when you get caught is just fucking loud too. It actually wound up startling me a couple of times. It isn't all bad though, as we actually end the day pretty successful we managed to find the one person who's actually willing to go on a date with us. So we head back and do what we usually do, go back home and celebrate with level 3 of StarCat, which at the end of the level introduces this little pink StarCat character who cheers us on. This is where the game actually kinda glitched out on me though, as I went back to the mall to talk to our date, you know, just to see if any of the dialogue changed or anything like that but talking to her actually messed up like the order of things or something, so the game told me I had to replay level 3. So that kinda sucked, but something actually interesting happened at the end of level 3. I wound up getting a blue star at the end of the level instead of the usual yellow one, although at the time I had no idea how. So we go to bed, wake up, and get ready for our date and it goes about as well as you'd expect for a story about Chris Chan. We get dragged around the mall for a bit, all the while still trying to dodge mall security, before she brings us right to the center of the mall for everyone to see, just so we can get dumped for this evil looking orange guy. And probably the worst part about this is apparently the whole mall was in on this too. Oh, ew. Well, okay, not everyone, but most of the regular customers of this mall were just waiting here just to see us get humiliated. Well, after that soul-crushing experience, we head home and play level 4. And as if the game itself is also tormenting us, level 4 ramps up the difficulty with spikes and enemies just plastered everywhere. What is this, a dimps game? And the worst part of it is, at the end of the level, a giant orange face flies out of nowhere and steals our girl. <laughs> Day 4 only gets worse. For one thing, the first thing that happens upon waking up is the narrator just decides to fucking give up on us, deeming us a lost cause. And if that isn't bad enough, there's a fucking army of security guys patrolling the entrance, so we can't even get into the main part of the mall. The only people in the part of the mall we can access are two dudes from earlier trying to give us unhelpful, generic advice, and a mysterious gentleman who says he's willing to help. He claims that StarCat is real, and he exists in an alternate dimension that we created. And he also claims we could even gain access to some of StarCat's powers. All we have to do is go to the end of level 3, but instead of nabbing the star, we actually drop down off the building and stand in front of this door for 10 seconds. 
So we do that, and enter this crazy ass chase section straight out of a Sonic.exe game. But we beat it and unlock the ability to roll in the real world, just like StarCat. At first I thought the roll just gave you a little speed boost, but apparently it also makes you completely undetectable to guards. So the cycle repeats again, find girls, get rejected, go home and play some StarCat. Now onto level 5 with another chase level, but we actually kind of get a boss fight here with the giant orange head from earlier. He tries to chase us and shoot some enemies at us, but we make pretty quick work of him. And upon defeating the boss and beating the level, we actually end up collecting a red star instead of a blue or yellow one this time. And we find out we kinda fucked up, as the pink star cat sobs and calls us a monster for killing their boyfriend. Though, to be fair to us, they kinda tried to kill us first. Self-defense, man. We head to bed again, and this time play through this fucked up nightmare sequence, chasing down the pink star cat in a maze of garbage, all the while being chased ourselves by the orange guy from earlier, as we get repeatedly told over and over again just how much of a weirdo we are. And on the next and final day, we find that mall security has gotten so sick of our bullshit that they have set up a human fucking shield of mall security just to prevent us from going in. But luckily for us, the shady character from earlier clues us in on how to achieve even more of StarCat's power. If we go back and kill every single enemy in a level before reaching the end, we'll get a red chaos star. And if we collect all of the red chaos stars, the dimensional merge will be complete. And having a boyfriend free girl won't even matter anymore. Uh, yeah, that sounds really tedious. How about we just get the good ending instead? If we instead go back and clear every level without killing a single enemy, we will be awarded a blue chaos star. And after going back and re-completing every single level, we get a cutscene of Star Cat slowly floating into the air and transforming into Super Star Cat, who controls about the same as Star Cat, but runs faster, jumps higher, and has infinite star meter. After clearing the Super Star Cat level though, it's not quite over yet, as we have one final challenge to overcome. Playing as ourselves. The controls are about the same here, except we don't jump nearly as high or go nearly as fast. We just have our shitty little roll. And unfortunately, this section does contain some parts that require precision platforming between rows of moving enemies, which, as we established before, isn't something the game does extraordinarily well. So this did give me a bit of trouble for a while, but strangely enough, I found that the roll can actually be used to defeat enemies. I mean, it also kills us too, but they do stay dead after we respawn, so I found it pretty handy for getting through this section. Though this does seem a little confusing from the whole game's message standpoint, having this big final test for being nice and not hurting people, to give me a part where I'm allowed and somewhat required to kill most of the enemies in my way. Just feels a little weird. Anyway, clear the level and a short cutscene plays where we absorb the powers of Super Star Cat and become Hyper Gungus, the power of being kind and respectful. So yeah, we got the good ending. We head on down to the mall, and this time things have changed for the better. Security isn't hunting us down, and people seem to love and respect us now. And going to the center of the mall and talking to the first woman we see, our love quest is complete as we walk off into the sunset together. Although, if you stick around a little bit, the after credit scene reveals that our happy ending isn't all it seems. Man, fuck these guys. I rolled in day fucking one, and all people did was just call me ugly and fat, and I didn't even do shit. Fuck this mall, we're gonna get the bad ending. I actually highly recommend getting the good ending first before going for the bad one, as you get to play as Super Star Cat in all the regular levels, and his infinite star meter makes killing every single enemy so much easier. 
So yeah, get all the red stars, transform into, I don't know, Dark Spine Star Cat, play through an inverse section of the good ending level where you just fucking plow through every single enemy you see, and then we become evil and fucked up in the real world as well, turning into this red chow looking motherfucker. And now it's back to the mall to extract our revenge. We blow past the wall of security with our new Star Blast ability, and murder every single person who wronged us. Hmm. Now, I get that one of the main criticisms of Chris Chan's character was the fact that they would often depict themselves as violently brutalizing and killing fictional versions of their real-life quote-unquote enemies in the Sonichu comics, but I'm not sure if I'm really comfortable with the illusion of our main character after being thoroughly humiliated and ostracized by his local community committing a mass murder at a public mall. But I'll give the creator the benefit of the doubt and say they were more so leaning towards the former rather than the latter. But yeah, no credits this time. You can go back and obliterate those guys as much as you want, but the game will never end. But there is actually one last ending in store for us. The true ending. To unlock it, first you need to collect both sets of blue and red chaos stars, and you need to be in your good form. If you just so happen to be stuck in your red evil form, just replay the good Starcat level. And after that, you'll be swapped back to the good version of your character. So, if you have everything set up the way it should be, you should now see this little animation of you on your TV screen rolling in place. So I guess this means we should try rolling through our TV screen and, hey, we pass right through. After walking out into the void for a bit, the screen fades to black. And as the screen fades back in, we now find that we are playing the game in first person, finding an ominous gray door set before us. Walking through it brings us to the mall, where all the people we've been talking to throughout the game are gathered. We can talk to them here, but that only results in them ridiculing us for being a complete embarrassment of a human being. Admitting that they actually don't want to see us improve, or get better, or get what we want. They just want something to laugh at. As one puts it, our misery is their entertainment, and that we only have ourselves to blame. Pressing on leads us to the outside of the mall, where the mystery man assures us not to worry, none of this is real, and the dimensional merge is almost complete. All we have to do left is go through one final door. Stepping through brings us to a town in the middle of a forest, with Starcat himself standing before us. Starcat congratulates us on finally making it to his world and completing the dimensional merge and that all we have to do is collect the final Chaos Star, and our love quest will finally be complete. And as our vision returns, we see now that Pink Star Cat has appeared, as well as a bunch of other tinier blue and pink star cats who all refer to us as Daddy. The Pink Star Cat tells us that she loves us, and Star Cat tells us how happy we'll all be now, and that we never have to leave here ever again. Though, if we explore around a bit, and look behind this little tree over here, we find a final, secret Chaos Star. And clicking on it, brings us right back to our room. We get a message from the developer themselves, congratulating us on getting the true, final ending of the game. Clicking on the bed, we get another message from the developer. They tell us that they love us, and that they'll miss us, and they hope to see us again soon. And then the game closes itself. Well, that was certainly an experience. Look, this game is pretty janky. Even the dev acknowledges it at one point. But despite the jank, I think this game does some pretty neat stuff. And while the main root of it is heavily story-based, and I'm sure there are a lot of opinions out there on whether it adapts its story well, especially being based around such a controversial individual, 
but just taking the game at its face value, I had a genuinely pretty fun time with this game. Figuring out the secrets of the game was actually pretty cool, and I felt like I never could really expect what the game would throw at me next. So you know what? Three stars. Pretty good. And yeah, those certainly were three random ass games. It's always nice to take the opportunity to shine a spotlight on some otherwise overlooked video games, though some might not shine as brightly as others. But anyway, yeah, this was just a fun little idea I had rattling around in my brain. I might do it again sometime. Once again, big thanks to my patrons, and by patrons I mean still just Dean. Hi Dean. And uh, I'll see you guys next time. Bye bye